gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Skullora Danceport. And, and today is the two year anniversary mark of Skullora Danceport. I have had so much fun the past two years organizing all these events, being able to talk to all these dancers, and just opening up my views and understanding uh, of the dance world. So, today, for you guys, my present to you is I have the one and only legend, okay? He is an amateur Italian national ballroom champion, amateur Italian national 10 dance champion. He's two times world professional ballroom champion, as well as European, UK, British Open Professional Champion, and he is the head of the Bariki Institute of Art and Movement. Ladies and gentlemen, I am talking about Mr. Luca Bariki. Hello, how are you today? Very well, nice to see you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, how is the weather today in California? Beautiful as always, California. I love California for the beautiful weather. All right, very good, very good. Luca, tell me, where were you raised and what did your childhood look like? I was born in uh, Italy, obviously, and uh, mm -hmm. in a small city. The name is Reggio Emilia. And he is ah, Reggio Emilia. In a, uh -huh, and in a small town up in the mountain. So I'm a mountain boy originally. And uh, until about six years old, I lived there, a small village. Um, and then uh, when it was time to go to school, then my family moved to the city so that I could, mm -hmm. I could access better education. And um, that's it. Then I started to dance and then uh, I was, uh, it was a school. It was about school, you know, normal school, right? They do, uh, and about dancing. So very simple. Well, okay, so you, mainly your priorities were school and the dancing, yes? Absolutely. I would say dancing and then school in that order. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah. So growing up, as yes. you were being, uh, excuse me, as you were focusing on the dancing in school, let me ask you this. Did you ever have a young love distract you from dancing or pursuing your dance career? No. Oh, so you were always head straight. You know, did you maybe think, no, I don't want a girlfriend or a wife because maybe that'll mix or mess anything while you were working on your future? I didn't, um, you know, in my life, obviously, as everybody, you, you make your mistakes and, you know, as a teenager, mm -hmm. you, you have uh, side influences and my friends at school were always the worst in class, you know, so I, I mm -hmm. like to mix with, with that kind of crowd. But the one thing that I never compromised was my practice, my my preparation for competitions my you know my my dancing was never affected by any any external distraction interesting you know? very good. and it was very easy to do that for me because i i just like what i did so you were so focused you wanted that dance ability and career so bad you didn't let anything distract you very good i like it yes mm -hmm. i'll have to say i i'm slightly the same way uh, with like, the past two years my dancing, I was able to take it to another level, seeing that I, I have a new coach the last two years. I moved into this academy, the Volga Dance Academy here in Atlanta. And uh, the level of discipline and organization and the system they have here, it, it, it not only changed me as a dancer, it also changed me as a person. So um, it, it's, made, it's made me a little more focused like you. So shout out to the coach, Katrina Volgina and the yeah, academy. That's, that's good, that's good, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Once you were at the peak of your dance career, who was your biggest adversary? Oh, I had many because in my generation uh, there were many great dancers coming out mm -hmm. of uh, the same generation. So I had many. I cannot give you one over another because it would be. I feel it would be dis disrespectful to the others. You know, it would be ah, undermining yes, the yes. others. So I feel. I feel I was privileged again to to have the opportunity to compete. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes win, sometimes lose from these other great dancers that, you know, were inspirational. I also had a uh, very impressive dance career like yours. So Absolutely. Uh, and very inspirational too, because uh, it was great motivation, right? Because you knew that mm -hmm. you had to prepare yourself always at your best because you would walk on the floor with other dancers that were also 
doing their mm-hmm. best and that of course dance. so it was great motivation so so i actually thank all of them you know for for pushing me uh, to, to keep giving and keep going yeah? exactly right to become greater mm-hmm. and greater so yeah so you would say in that case you would say keep your friends close and your enemies even closer not to say that they were your enemies but your competitors you wanted to keep them close that to give you that motivation i think it's important to have respect for your of course yes right i think mm-hmm. it's very important to have the respect and to be honest with yourself right and appreciate what others are doing mm-hmm. you know it's easy it's easy psychologically to say to find bad things to say about people that are challenging you right because uh, then you feel better about yourself mm-hmm. something that i always try to do i always try to actually look at the positive on these dancers you know and and uh, in fact learn from them right mm-hmm. by watching their performance not copying them right like we said earlier not not by trying to do what they were doing but being inspiration to me too you know and, and having great respect for them and knowing that of course we go on the floor every time is uh, is a new competition so the fact that i maybe won the last competition doesn't mean that i'm going to win the next the next one mm-hmm. and the fact that i lost the, ne- the the competition doesn't mean i'm going to lose the next one right so every competition is going to be a new a new experience and uh, and as i said it was a privilege to share it with with so many great dancers I agree. I agree 100%. I, do, I like, uh, I enjoyed that answer. Our following questions comes from our audience member, Anna. She says, your biography on your website mentions that your development grew from an inward directed focus rather than external influences. Could you elaborate on what that means for you and what the benefits are to being self-oriented in the art of dance work? Yes. yes. As I mentioned earlier, being uh, being selfish is a vital aspect of of mm-hmm. becoming great at what you do. And 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 again, as I mentioned earlier, I don't mean the bad selfish where you just care about yourself and you don't care about the, the good else, selfish. But the good selfish, right? You have mm-hmm. to be. Uh, you have to develop yourself. So before you can develop your, yourself, you have to know yourself you have to understand yourself you have to accept yourself so you have to understand what makes you you right right who are mm-hmm. you right so you have to get very much in touch with yourself if you then want to discover what your gifts are and develop them so uh, i guess partly because of my personality that is is like that Right, so it, I'm, I'm kind of tend to go in that direction. I, I do things that I like to do. I do things that I feel good with. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, I feel good doing. And um, also, as a young dancer, I wanted to enjoy myself when I was dancing. I wanted to be fulfilled. Right before. Mm-hmm worrying about if anybody else liked it or didn't like it you wanted to feel the joy that we were discussing earlier yes correct it was something that it was it was the dancing was um, you know and anything that i shared with an audience uh, was an overflow of what i was experiencing Mm -hmm. yeah and also as a young man i was very shy oh interesting yeah, so I am definitely not the type of person that feels comfortable being the center of attention in a big crowd and this kind of thing. So it was quite easy for me, therefore, to go in, right? Mm-hmm. To, you know, even in a performance situation, I never felt comfortable trying to show something that I was not experiencing, right? To show off, yes. Yeah. Right. Because I always felt that then is a lie. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it's artificial. It's it's almost fake, kind of. Correct. Correct. Well, it is fake, right? Because I'm trying to show you, but I'm not experiencing it. So, mm-hmm. so that always made me feel very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I realized that the only way I could become a great performer was by going in and develop my own sense and my own. Um, 
and find my own fulfillment, try and find the way I, my body wanted to move, expressing what I wanted to express. And I had to believe, and again, and this is where the establishment supported this belief of mine, that if what I was expressing was true to me, so it was therefore it was not a lie, it was not pretending, but it was real, mm -hmm. right? I was full, really fully experiencing that. People would accept it and people would love it. Because it looked real, it looked authentic. Because it was real, correct, mm -hmm. right? Because it was real, right? Because I, I, I truly experienced it. Mm -hmm. Of course. Right? So it wasn't it wasn't something I tried to pretend to experience. It was a it was a true experience. And when when that happens, that overflow of emotion and expression is very powerful, right? And mm -hmm. people feel that. People feel that they feel touched by it because it's real. Right, right. They feel like a, like a movie almost, like a really good movie, like an actor. There you go. So would you agree with the sentence that dancers partially have to be actors? Absolutely, but they have to be great actors, right? Mm -hmm. Not 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 soap opera actors, right? Which are pretending to to feel something or to express something, right? But it, it is exactly the same. I mean, we are expressing, um, we are creating a vision to a sound, mm -hmm. right? As a yes. dancer, we are creating a vision to a sound. So we are we are using our body to express, right? We're using our body, energy, space. Uh, to express something and like a great actor uh, the great actor experiences that as a true emotion right while he's mm -hmm. acting it right that's what makes a great actor that's why when we look at an actor we we maybe can cry with the actor or we can be very excited or very nervous right for the actor we know it's a movie, right? We know it's on TV, right? It's not real, but we're still emotionally touched and affected by it because they are truly experiencing that. Of course, yeah. Right? So, by choice, right? So, the same as a dancer, absolutely. The same Very interesting. Dancer. This question uh, made me think of another question we have. So, if you don't mind, we're going to quickly skip down to this question about emotions. As you were discussing, dancers have to produce emotions and feelings, as you were saying, to, to really show their authentic self. So let me ask you this. Yes. Adjudicators are not robots. Adjudicators are humans. Humans have emotions, and dancing is all about creating emotions. How does an adjudicator judge fairly? Of course, I cannot talk on behalf of all adjudicators. Yes, mm -hmm. um, I can talk from my experience as an adjudicator, mm -hmm. which I have since removed because I'm no longer adjudicating. Oh, yes, because I, I want to have a very open relationship with the students, and I feel ah. that it is much more effective if the mm -hmm. students don't consider me and a teacher that is, right a teacher that is also a judge right but i'm literally just a mentor right and they can open mm -hmm. and discuss everything because i'm not going to be on the floor the next weekend knowing all their secrets <laughs> and uh, right and then judging them at the same time right so this, mm -hmm. this can be that so that's that's a choice that i made and i'm very comfortable with that i i like that uh, but mm -hmm. when I used to judge, um, there can be very many different parameters that you can use, right, as, a, as an adjudicator. Um, WDSF has tried, right, to create criteria and, and structure it in a certain way and focusing on one mm -hmm. criteria rather than another. Uh, I understand what they are trying to do. I'm not sure that at this moment in time that's that's fully effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the old system is effective either, right? Uh, that there's things that can be developed in that. Mm -hmm. But as a, at a personal level, as an adjudicator, it is about what I feel when I watch you move. 
Okay. Right? So if we're talking at a high level, right? So of course, if we're talking at a lower level, I may look at the technique, I may look at the, the technical qualities, musicality, yes. Right. right, but if we're talking at a higher level, right? It's, it's about what I feel when I, when I experience what you're doing. Do I feel comfortable, right? Do I feel part of what you're doing because you are fully experiencing it? Or do I feel nervous about it? I remember the first competition I, I judged, um, I finished the, the judging day and I had pain. I mean, my neck locked, yeah? Because I had absorbed all the tension that these dancers had in their body while they were dancing. Oh, wow. Right. Um, so, so the final decision is what do I feel when I look at your dance? And so is your movement instinctive for you, right? Do you look fully coordinated in the movement mm -hmm. or does your movement look taut? Right, right. Does it look very disciplined, but overly disciplined where you are like a machine so you can deliver it five million times the same, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or is it are you experiencing it in that precise moment, you know? Uh, this for me is at the end is what adjudicators do. Now, after that, they may, they will have to give some explanation to that. So then they may say, well, I didn't feel comfortable because of this and this and that reason, right? But mm -hmm. at the end at the core is that they didn't feel comfortable watching it. Intriguing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at the, and at the end of the day, it truly is all about emotions and 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 understanding a hundred percent what it is inside. Going back to this individual, excuse me, individual individuality, it's all about that at the end of the day. Yes, it is about it is about the delivery of an intention. And okay, as an audience, I, I have to understand what is your intention but not only understand it intellectually i have to understand it emotionally too ah. mm -hmm. right and as an adjudicator same thing right i look at you now do i understand what is your intention what are you delivering what are you expressing do i understand it or do you leave me with a lot of question marks if you leave mm -hmm. me with question marks i will start to pick i will start to see things that are not right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. Now I understand where you are going. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's a delivery of a message, right? And the delivery has to be clear. That's right. That's right. It does. Because, for example, you know, how can a first place winner be a first place winner without it being clear what they're doing? They truly have to understand every little step, every, every little feather step that they have. Right. Or maybe nobody's clear and then somebody will still have to win. And this happens also in competitions. You know, you will have nobody great on the floor, but you still have to then... You still have the winner, yes, yes. You still have mm -hmm. the winner, right? But the winner is just a little better than everybody else. Everybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so discussing a little bit, going back to our... how we teach, how do you balance two or more different pieces of information from two, of course, or more trusted coaches? Give me an example of what you mean by that. Uh, so what do I mean? Let's say, for example, uh, I am part of a team who says, who teaches this way and they say this way. But then I also have an instructor who is on another team who says, you have to teach this way. You have to dance this way. Both of these instructors from both teams, you grew up with, you train with them, you trust them, but they're saying something different. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Well, I believe that um, you are your number one teacher. Okay. Could you elaborate a little bit? Mm -hmm. So, at the end, you are in your body, right? Mm -hmm. So, I am inside my own body. So, I uh, have to move the way that I'm designed to move. Um, I have to express what I want to express. Mm -hmm. So, and this for me was very clear from very young age, right? That I am my number one teacher. Now, it doesn't mean I know everything, right? Don't misunderstand me, right? It's not a, it's not a, 
a statement of arrogance, right? But it's the fact that it is my body, it is my emotion, it is my mind. So I have to be at the end my best teacher, right? I have mm-hmm. to work things out. I can listen, right? I can get feedback. And I was privileged to have amazing teachers. But at the end, also, as I mentioned earlier, the moments where they, these teachers actually said to me, today you were great. In those moments, I actually did what I wanted to do, not what they wanted me to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. But obviously under the guidance, under their influence, but that mm-hmm. information was translated to fit to me. Okay. I, th- I understand. Yes. So right? if, if maybe, so just to understand, if the teacher tells you you are great, but maybe in yourself, you didn't feel great. Maybe you feel like there was something you could have fixed or something you could have done better. Is, it, is this what you mean? No, because I mean, there's always something that you can do better. What Mm -hmm. I'm saying is, when my teacher said, today you were great. That greatness came from me doing what I felt right. Ah, okay. Now I understand. Yeah, not by doing exactly what they were teaching me. What they were teaching me was the guideline. The guide. Okay. Yes. The guidance. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Going back to your question of two teachers that are telling you opposite things, they may want the same thing, but they will tell you, they will describe it from their angle. They will describe it from their perception. This is where instinctive perception becomes very relevant. Mm -hmm. Right? So, because they will teach you from what worked for them, right? What worked for them, what they understand. Mm -hmm. Right. They want to achieve this. Maybe they want to achieve the same thing. But... The process of achieving that may be different, right? Maybe different path. So of it course. seems as if you know they're saying maybe the opposite things to each other or conflicting things to each other. But in reality, it's only because they are describing the process from their point of view, mm-hmm. not from your point of view. Right. And what made them individual? may not make you individual so you always have to translate it back into your mind what correct makes it work i understand i like it very good yeah and this is what this is what again with the institute this is what we are doing so if you experience a day uh, if you spend a day with me or with any of our certified teachers while we are sharing you will see that i will teach differently to different people Mm-hmm. Right, because I will teach from their language, right. not from my language. Right, so my language it will adapt to the perception of the student. Of course, because every student is different. Maybe, right. for example, yelling at one student will work, but maybe at another one it won't. So, yes, yeah, so I do have to agree. You have to always, not maybe exactly switch the way you teach, but you have to adjust to every student. Yes. Yes, not only personality wise, not only personality wise, but also you may perceive your center here. Mm-hmm. Right? I may perceive my center in my rib cage. So, how I will share information with you will all be based on the fact that you're perceiving a center in a particular part and you're perceiving an indirect center in another part of your body. Or you have a parallel perception, what we define as a parallel perception, or you have a cross perception. And therefore, the language will also change depending from understanding. First of all, therefore, the, the first assessment is always um, understanding you, understanding how you like to move. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. So, is the teacher that adapts to the student and then guides the student in their unique perception to develop mm-hmm. rather than the student having to change to fit to the teacher yes yes i agree i agree 100 yeah. so, so on this topic of teaching and having to basically of course guide the student and you have to adjust for the student this following question also comes from anna based on your experience in composing routines for couples of different age, level, and capabilities, 
How do you assess a dancer when composing a routine specifically designed for them? What factors come into play? Yeah, very relevant question. The, obviously, first of all, the level of awareness that the student has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, because the, the difficulty of the routine, yeah, because for me, there's a differentiation between routine and choreography. Oh, tell us, elaborate. So, routine is what you are dancing, so the figures, mm -hmm. right? So, the combination of figures that you do. Uh, choreography is how you dance them. Oh, right? so, so how you interpret it. Correct. Correct, right? Again, what is the intention? What is the story that you're delivering? What is your expression? So, that's the choreographical aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I develop a routine for the couple, the, the level of difficulty of the routine will depend first of all, or the type of routine will depend first of all on the level of awareness of the student. Mm -hmm. Right? What can the student handle? Right. How, how deep? How deep inside does the student understand him or herself? How much? Is he in right. touch with himself? Right, because mm -hmm. right. Right? Uh, I want the routine to help the student, not to become a challenge for the student. Mm -hmm. Right, because okay. I want the student to, I want the student to have the possibility inside that routine to create a, choreogra a choreographical value. Right, mm -hmm. right. But if the if the couple, if the student is running after the routine because the routine is too complex then the student has no chance to develop any choreography. Right, then he can't interpret it. Anything. Nothing, nothing right? Because he's just running after the steps. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the first thing that I would use as a point of evaluation. What is the level of awareness of the student? Uh, the second step would be what perception does the student have? Mm. Right? Is it parallel? Of course, I understand that when I say parallel, cross, posterior, anterior, it makes no sense at the moment, right? Because there's no understanding of the method. But right um, yeah we we have dancers that are what we define as parallel dancers and they have certain characteristics we have dancers that are cross perception dancers they have different characteristics um anterior perception or po posterior perception or interior perception or exterior perception there's so many aspects that have to be evaluated on the person first of all mm -hmm. on the individuals Right, because it's two people dancing together. So you of have course. to understand the perception of one person, the perception of the other person, and then see how the fusion of the two. How to put it together. Mm -hmm. Right. And therefore, what is best for them? Which figures, right? Which combination of routine fits to this particular combination of dancing? Mm -hmm. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Uh, because again, I don't want to make the routine a negative challenge for the dancer right so mm -hmm. if, if the dancer is as cross perception and the routine is developed for a parallel perception this dancer will feel very uncomfortable delivering that yeah i'm sure that in your experience alessandro or for anybody that is listening to to our conversation you know there are figures right that you feel comfortable with right mm -hmm. you, are, you are delivering certain movements and you feel good with that and then you do other movements, other figures, other actions that you feel very uncomfortable with. Of course. And that is your body telling you that I, I don't like this kind of movement. Right? Mm -hmm. This is where also injuries can come. This is where often right. injuries do come because intellectually we are pushing ourselves to do things that our body is not designed to do. Somebody else maybe is designed to do that, but maybe my body is not designed to do that. And as a mm -hmm. result, because I'm forcing my body to do movements that are not mine, I will get injuries. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the routine itself, the design of the routine, uh, requires a a previous understanding of awareness of the level of awareness of each student and an understanding of their own instinctive perception 
so that then the routine can be created to help them create an expression mm -hmm. to their benefit right and not work against them right right very nice very nice now this following question comes from a dancer in new york my friend karat he asks as a competitive dancer how do you mentally prepare for a competition any dancer has a moment of possibly freaking out or feeling not ready regardless of his level and experience so how does one how would one be prepared for an event mentally or even physically Yes, I remember my time as a competitor, especially my earlier, my earlier, year, earlier years. Um, one month before competition, right, I was ready, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and of course, situation was different. Yeah, especially in the professional, you know, we had not as many competition, let's say, as here in the US, right? Where every weekend you can go and do a competition, yeah? So we had less amount of competition. So you would prepare, of course, for us, three major competitions in the year, plus, plus World Championship, plus European Championship. Mm -hmm. um, and then some other small competition that we would use as a, as a point of reference to test things out. So you would pre be preparing for a competition. So. A month before, month and a half before, felt great, felt ready. I knew what I would deliver on the performance. Three weeks before, maybe a little problems come, you know, just a little bit of stress started to appear. Not much, mm -hmm. just a little bit. Uh, two weeks before, things are starting not to work as they did a couple of weeks ago. Oh, One week okay. before the performance, okay, nothing works. Mm. Uh, and this, of course, is a psychological, right? It was due to the pressure of getting closer to the competition. Uh, okay, right? that so, makes sense. Right? One month one, one month, or, or over one month before competition, the feeling is like, I have time right. to prepare, right? The closer I get to the competition, the less time I feel I have to prepare. And I don't feel ready because there are still things that are not working exactly as I would like them to. And of course, the closer, therefore, you get to the competition, the less sense of time to develop there is, the more pressure comes. Mm -hmm. So how did I master that? Firstly, by not making the competition my goal. Right? Really? But yeah, but allowing the competition to just be a day through my development, right? So I look a little bit more on the long term. So rather than setting the goal that, okay, I have to be great in this day, in this competition, right? I understood and I switched my attention to, okay, my evolution is going to be constant, right? Mm -hmm. So now I am 52 years old and I'm still evolving, right? And I plan to do so until time comes uh, to move uh, somewhere else. And um, so I shifted my attention to a more of a long-term plan, right? So I'm going to continue to evolve now. Okay, I'm continuing to evolve. And now this Sunday, it happens that I have a competition. So mm -hmm. I go and do the competition. I will do the best I can in this competition. But I know that Monday I will go back to the studio and I continue my evolution. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, yeah. What if this competition discussing long terms, what if this competition is like, it is nationals to qualify for the world championships. What about then? Then it's even more pressure. How do you handle that? Do you take the nationals as just any other day? Sure. sure. It is just another really? day. Really? It is just another day. I mean, if you're focused every, every day in your evolution, mm -hmm. right? Now, obviously, if I don't, if I spend most, most of my time at the beach, right? And then mm -hmm. uh, I say, well, okay, now I have a competition, so I better do something about it. Right, is one thing. But if I am daily working on my evolution, when I get to the competition, it just is, it's another day. Right? Okay. So I don't make it Makes important. Sense. Right? Because I'm, I'm constantly evolving in any case. Right? So, and I'm never ready. That's another thing that is very important. You are never ready. So don't try to be ready. Work towards oh. it work towards it but don't aim to feel ready because you will never you never will 
because there's because you're in evolution there is always going to be something else that you're working on that, is that you can always yet. fix or improve right that is not yet happening right because you're working on it at the moment so accepting that uh, then you enjoy a lot more the journey mm-hmm. right rather than try to put your attention too much on the destination okay that right i agree i agree i think that right. to our listeners and viewers maybe that'll make them feel slightly excuse me slightly better uh, as within the next few months as these world championships happen i hope uh, a lot of our viewers and listeners listen to what you're saying it's very it's very mind opening and, and a little bit um how do you say stress relief or relief of stress they're relieved of their stress right right another thing that also was very important for me regarding this alessandro was i i enjoy uh, motor sports yeah so if you ask me which sport do i follow you know i'm not big i'm not a big fan in, of soccer right or as an italian i should right I'm not Pero abbiamo vinto. <laughs> right of course i'm very happy i'm very happy when, uh, when italy does well uh, of course if there's a world cup i will follow it or, mm. or right or a european cup but i don't have a favorite team i don't have this kind mm. of thing right um but i so i favor motorsports right so when i watch when i watch moto gp right or this kind of thing right motorcycles especially what i learned from them is you know normally they have their practice on the friday they have their qualifying on the saturday and then they have the race on the sunday mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now normally the best riders crash on the friday crash on the sunday but win on the sunday Oh, intriguing right and the reason for that is because they push the limit on the Friday right, they go more and more and more and more to, to test right. their boundaries yeah exactly right they test the limit where is the limit right mm-hmm. so they're not they're not afraid of making the mistake right they're not trying to stay safe and go around the track perfectly mm-hmm. right not on the Friday right also right. not on the Saturday Right? And then go perfect yeah. on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Correct. Right? And they have found now the limits. They found where the limit is. So if you check the lap time of a of a motorcycle racer, they are always their lap time is faster on the Saturday than on the Sunday in the race. Right? In the race they take it slightly more easily. Right? They stay within the boundaries. Because oh now it's because they've trained so much that they can afford to to do a little slightly. less. Mm-hmm. Correct. So that's also very important, right? Because as a young competitor, I used to do the opposite. I used to, you know, in practice, I used to feel very comfortable. And then when I go to the competition, now I try to do more. Right. And if you haven't practiced that more, then I agree. It's unknown, right? You enter the unknown territory. Now you don't know what's going to happen. Right, mm-hmm. and of course, in a competition, you have a lot more stress factors because the floor is not the one you're used to practice on. That's right. It's a little bit more slippy, it's a little bit more sticky, it's bigger, it's smaller. There's other couples on the floor. There are judges watching it. There is an audience. Right. If you make the mistake, you can't stop. Right. You have to continue to dance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to repeat that for many rounds. Right. So the stress factor is much higher. So of course, if you if you cruise during the week at practice because you want to feel good and you want to feel comfortable and you want to make no mistakes and you want to make sure that you make no mistakes naturally when you go on the sunday competition you're going to push harder right because now the mm-hmm. adrenaline is there you're going to try harder but now you're going to a very untested territory in the most stressful moment and situation mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so i believe in the opposite yeah, so later in my career, I did the opposite. I made lots of mistakes during the week because I was trying to push my boundaries. Right? I made mm-hmm. lots of mistakes during the week, try to explore, okay, where is the limit of my range of movement? Where is my limit on what I want to express? Found the limit on the Sunday, right? If we use the Sunday as the day of the competition, it could be the Saturday, right? It could be any day, right? On the day of the competition, I would always do a little less. I like that. I like that because you you train so much, you were able to afford to kind of correct press the brakes. I like that. I like it. And now that a little bit less, 
allow me to feel comfortable, right? Because now I'm not on the limit. I'm not pushing myself even past the limit. No, no. I know where my limit is for today, right? Up to now. Now, after competition, I will push my limit further for the next competition, right? But for this competition, this is how much I can do. So I'm going to do a little less so that now I feel settled. Right, so that you can perform at what you know, what you can bring to the table. I like that. Absolutely. I like that a lot. Absolutely. 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 I like right? that. And that took a lot of stress away from me, right? Because then I knew mm -hmm. that, okay, I could push, push, push. And in fact, where at the beginning I was afraid of the mistakes, right? I didn't want to make, make mistakes. I wanted to practice things 100 times and not making any time the mistake, right? I wanted to be sure that I would not make any mistake. Um, mm -hmm. I started to embrace the mistakes. I started to want to make the mistake, right? Because also by making the mistakes, you're learning. Of course. Mm -hmm. Right? Your experience grows. Your ability to recover from a mistake develops and so on. And then you know that, okay, I, when I get to the side, it doesn't matter if I make mistakes now because now I'm pushing my limits, right? But I know when I get to the day of competition, I'm going to do a little bit less. So I'm going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So psychologically, it's a totally different approach to your preparation for a performance. Of course, of course. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> so to get to our final question for tonight, uh, Mr. Luca, from my yes. beautiful, beautiful dance partner, Mary Marakaro. Mary wants to know, what is your opinion on the progress of standard? Say, for example, from the 1970s to the 90s to the present day. What would you say has changed this evolution we've been discussing? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot of evolution, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, let's start from this. Uh, I'm going to try and give a good, a clear answer. The, mm -hmm. Let's analyze one moment what is couple dancing. Yeah, no style, no matter what style, ballroom, Latin, any style, right? But what is mm -hmm. couple dancing? It is about two human beings, right, interacting with each other, expressing music. Mm -hmm. Right? So we can define any style of two people dancing together as that, right? That's the core value. Sure, of course. Right? Now, in the 1970s or 60s, um, obviously they, there was no pressure in the dancers, right? To make these big shapes and having these big forms, right? Mm -hmm. So the dancing was a lot more intimate. And, uh, right, when we watch videos of the old guys uh, dancing, right? It's beautiful. Right, it's elegant. Uh, you can see the interaction between the two. Right, people. it's very classy. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And there's a there's a there's a depth of interaction of the intimacy of musical expression that is beautiful to watch. As the generation developed, obviously, we always want to do more. Right, mm -hmm. as humans, we want to grow. Right, so range became a little bigger. Um, everything has started to grow and grow. And I would say up to my generation, mm, there was a growth also in shape, right? In the usage of space, right? We needed to use more space. The reason for that was given by the desire to increase the range of movement, mm -hmm. right? So because we want to use our bodies more, we cannot be so close to each other, right? If we're so of intimate course. with each other, the movement has to be a lot more micro movements, right? When we want to extend and expand and use our possibilities of our body more, we also require more space. Mm -hmm. And also more space from each other, right? So that's, that's why right. the distance, right? That's why the distance became greater between the man and the woman, and therefore the volume became bigger, the arm interaction with each other changed yeah so everything evolved with that but that change of volume had a very clear function mm -hmm. right it was and the function of it was to increase the range of movement and therefore increase the level of expression 
Now, the generation that came later, obviously, didn't see the older boys, right? Immediately <laughs> saw the bigger shape, the bigger volume, and copied that. <clears throat> right? So then volume is volume just for the sake of volume. Yes, there's, it's just volume. There's no point. Volume. No story behind it. No story, right? No function to it. Right, no reason for it. It's just I'm big because I have to be big, right? Because if I mm -hmm. if I have the biggest frame, I'm going to win the competition. If I have the biggest right. space, I'm going to win the competition. Because right? it's okay like this. Is it okay? Exactly, exactly, right? So so then things started to go wrong, right? Because then that's why I'm saying right through all this interview, right? I'm all about innovation, right? I'm I'm you know we are studying biomechanics, we are studying instinctive perception, we're studying so many things, right? To con continue to push the boundaries of the of the limits right of mm -hmm. human being in movement but at the same time we must not lose the essence of what we are doing right yeah, and the essence of what we are doing mm -hmm. is two human beings interacting and expressing music now the moment we use we lose the interaction Right, because everybody's just trying to have a big shape, but they're they're not even trying to dance together or feel each other, right? Right. Look, it looks like two people, but not dancing as one. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. So now we're missing the essence of it, right? Because now there's no interaction. When I then see also these shapes that, you know, beautiful. I mean, young people can do this very well, right? Because they they very young, able body. They can hold shapes for a long time, and they are beautiful shapes, but. Are they expressing any music? Are they expressing any emotion? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be for me what, what has evolved and what has gone uh, wrong in the evolution right. is that, uh, is the fact that things, you know, change has happened, not evolution. Mm -hmm. Right? So change, right. just for the sake of change, right? Of doing something different, of being more interesting. And as I said, I'm not like a, a traditionalist, right? Mm -hmm. I'm all about innovation. But at the same time, I understand that innovation and evolution must come. In order for me to evolve something, I, I have to understand that something from the original core. Mm -hmm. and then I can evolve it. Otherwise, the danger is just to change it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I feel that that is what has, this is what has happened. You know, in, uh, again, we're looking at WDSC and WDSF, we're looking at WDC more on a traditional way, right? And But tradition has become not moving, holding mm -hmm. the posture, you know, looking as if nothing is changing while they are trying to move around the room. So very boring and no expression. Mm -hmm. together because again together because maybe centered if we want to define that as center but not not sharing anything together on the other hand then we have wdsf full of expression right trying to maximize everything but with this search for big volume and big spaces without reason without reason mm -hmm. right without function just for the sake of making a big shape um not to express something not to share something in the partnership mm -hmm. so in the institute what we are working on is we started with this alessandro right balance right right mm -hmm. so pushing boundaries pushing the boundaries getting the dancers to maximize their physical ability and continue to do training. We have all kinds of designed exercises to develop the awareness, to develop the range of movement in the bodies, and so on. Uh, at the same time, organize information in a way that it becomes very clear, right? What is biomechanical? So what is about the body? What is about the physicality of the movement? What is about space, mm -hmm. right? What is about spatial awareness? How can we use spatial awareness to develop our movement, to interact with each other? Um, and how out of that can we then create a creativity and expression that recognizes so that as a couple we can become a visual to a sound. Mm -hmm. Not to just music, because it's on the 
to represent the music authentically. Right. So um, I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, I think it was very nice. I think Maddie, my my partner, will really appreciate it. <laughs> Our first audience member is coming to us from Huntsville, Alabama. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Claire Shepard. Hi, Luca. How are you? Hi, Claire. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Hi, Alessandra. Thank you for having me. Of course. So, Luca, I would really love to ask you, um, what is the best piece of advice you feel you've received from a coach? When you were a dancer, yes. what was the best piece of advice that your coach gave you? Oh, I see. Um, possibly to stay very clear with my mind and with the information that I would receive. Um, this came to me very, uh, very early in my career and I believe that this advice actually helped me to shape my career the way uh, it then developed. Um, and this particular teacher, his name was actually Hans Laxon. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said to me, it's very important, you know, you're talented, young dancer, but it's very important that you keep your mind very clear and that you, you have very clear direction and information of how you want to develop so that you don't waste time, you mm -hmm. know, try to find answers uh, in every possible direction. So I would say that's the best advice that I received. Mm -hmm. So really just stay clear and, you know, you're dancing and there's the goals you want to achieve and make sure you maintain that. Yes, not not only in the, um, you know, not getting distracted by life itself, right, and stay focused on the, on the goal, but also in uh, choosing uh, very selected, let's say, teachers, right, to work okay. with, so that there would not be too much information and too much information that sometimes sound uh, opposite, right, and mm -hmm. therefore can confuse the evolution. So in that sense, particularly, you know, keeping the educational part of, of the... Okay of the growth very simple and clear all right thank you so much you're welcome very nice thank you so much claire all right now mr luca coming to us next from the yes. same country that you represented we have miss elisa randazzo hi luca hi alessandro thank you for for having me hi, um, elisa. luca thank you for being here um i guess mine is a timely question, um, if you can see it this way, but uh, given the Olympics are on at the moment, uh, for many years, uh, a lot of people have been uh, striving to see dance sport uh, as part of the Olympics. Um, so I, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And also, if you were for it, how would you see this happening? How would you go about doing it? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I am generally open to evolution. So I believe in, you know, respecting tradition, right? And understanding where we are coming from so that evolution can go in the right direction and not become just a change, right? For the sake of change. So I'm, I'm always very open to evolution. Of course, having um, dancing involved in the Olympics could be obviously very powerful, right? And it could be a, a big step forward for our environment. Um, and this discussion of Olympics, you know, uh, I remember it even when I was competing, and this is a long time ago, right? So it's over 20 years or 30 years that uh, there is this discussion of are we ever going to get to the Olympics? Do I th would I be in favor? Uh, yes, because of evolution, right? It would have to be done consciously, right? So not again, not to lose the essence of what dancing is. Um, how would I go about it? In in all honesty, I have never put any attention to that, so I would not be able to give you any clear idea now of what I would do to get it into the Olympics. But uh -huh. am I in favor? I'm generally in favor of evolution. I think that's the best answer I can give you. So if evolution brings Olympics uh, as part of it, why not? Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Luca. You are very, very nice. Thank you, Elisa. Now our next question uh, is in the form of a video, Luca. From Huntsville, Alabama as well, we have Mr. Joseph Galloway. Hi, my name is Joseph Galloway, and I would like to know what is your favorite country you have traveled to and why? 
So the question is, what is your favorite country that you have traveled to, and why? The, my favorite country that I traveled to, and why? Um, I would say the United States. Uh, is the nice, favorite very country. nice. <laughs> And California being my favorite state, so I, I you know, in my in my uh, long life, I had the opportunity to travel to many different countries and actually live in many countries as well. Mm -hmm. And um, but I am most happy when I'm here in California. So I would say definitely California, US is my favorite place. And Very nice. Now, where in California are are you? I'm in uh, Irvine. Nice, very nice. Yeah, I, I so have a I have a cousin in San Jose. <laughs> oh, so we are nearly neighbors. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so our following question as well comes in a video form. Uh, this one comes from my friend Alexandru Ardian from Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the past couple of years, uh, do you think ballroom dancing has become too athletic, and in the process, it lost its. Uh, artistry or do you think there's still room for improvement in regards to athletics and of course artistry okay can you can you just repeat the question uh, alessandro because i couldn't hear it very well yes so his question is do you feel today with the modern dancing do you feel that possibly the ballroom has lost its touch has it become too athletic uh, he wants to uh, he would like a, an answer to is it getting too much athletic? Is there such a thing as too much? Hmm. I think it's a good question. The question is a... Um, it's a very interesting que question and probably requires a very long answer. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'll, try, I'll try to keep it short for today though, but... Um, I think it's always about balance, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, it's about respecting the history so respecting where we are coming from, respecting the, the essence of what dancing is, but then it should constantly be in evolution. So it is, it is important that we evolve and we evolve every aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem, I feel that the difficulty, maybe not the problem, but what is happening at the moment, let's say, if I witness what is going on at the moment, um, I may see a certain direction which is emphasizing the, the athletic, athletic value, but maybe sure. not so much the artistic value, maybe not so much the emotional value. And then I see another direction which is more about, okay, try to be more emotional, right? But then losing artistry, losing the, the mm -hmm. dynamics yes, of, of it. So what I believe is the right direction is to combine the two. So there's nothing wrong with increasing the athletic abilities, right? Because in theory, better athletic abilities can allow also for a better artistic expression. So of course, yes. I don't see the two as necessarily being against each other. Um, but at the moment, I feel this is what is happening. I feel yeah, there are two, two very powerful influencing influences. And one is, as I said, more athletic, but maybe compromising the emotional aspect of things. And the other one, try to be emotional, but in the danger of becoming boring out of it and, and losing yes. the athletic and the evolution that is actually necessary. So combining the two, I think, uh, would be the, the best solution. So you would uh, agree to uh, have a good balance, yes? I believe life is about balance. Okay, I like that. I love that quote. Life is right. truly all about balance. Right. So, you know, we, we dance with the body. So the body should be fit, should be ready, should be trained. Uh, we, but we should also dance with our heart. We should also, mm -hmm. yeah, we should be complete. We should be total in our performance. Therefore, every aspect of, of the human being should be involved and not, not um, choosing. Just one mm -hmm, or course. the other. Good, good. So overall, having a good balance. I do love that quote. I'm going to have to take it one day. I do love you, it. You're welcome to borrow it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Our next follower comes to us from La Sicilia. Now, followers and listeners, don't worry. While this question will be in Italian, I will put subtitles for you. 
Welcoming from La Sicilia, we have La Signora Luciana Todaro. <laughs> Buonasera, salve. Buonasera, Luciana. Salve, Luca. Salve, piacere di conoscerla. Piacere mio. Grazie. E allora, la mia domanda per te è questa. Ehm, allora, volevo sapere se i tuoi genitori eh, ti hanno supportato eh, nella tua carriera di ballo e in quale modo, se sì. Mm -hmm. Sì, sicuramente. Io ho iniziato a ballare a nove anni perché i miei genitori sono insegnanti. Ah, Quindi eh. sono stati i miei insegnanti all'inizio sino a quando ho iniziato poi a eh, viaggiare in Inghilterra e quindi ho iniziato, sono stato diciamo, introdotto ad insegnanti in Inghilterra, ma loro sono sempre stati presenti, mi hanno sempre seguito anche alle competizioni, anche più, più avanti nel, nel, nella mia età, no? quando comunque ero magari secondo al mondo o campione del mondo, comunque loro erano sempre presenti ehm, per darmi un sostegno emotivo. No? Mm. E, e mi hanno sicuramente sostenuto anche nelle decisioni, quando ho deciso di lasciare l'Italia e di trasferirmi a Londra appunto per continuare l'evoluzione del mio ballo, loro sono stati molto eh, di supporto, mi hanno iniziato, inizialmente anche supporto, support, eh, dato supporto finanziario no? quando mi sono trasferito perché ero giovane, avevo 17 anni, quindi certo. non potevo ancora magari… Importante. È molto importante. Molto penso, importante. Penso il, sostegno, il sostegno dei genitori penso sia aiuti. Si può fare senza, ma se c'è il sostegno dei, dei genitori è sempre meglio. Certo, certo, d'accordissimo, concordo. Grazie mille. Grazie, grazie a te, grazie. piacere di averti conosciuto. Piacere mio. Grazie, Luciana. Okay. Prego. All right, now our next guest is an Armenian dancer that comes to us from Atlanta. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Anna Nagirian. Ciao, Luca. I would like to know, um, in regards to the instinctive perception method of the body dance too, um, you mentioned that as an individual dancer, one needs to filter out um, information given to them by coaches or trainers, by what one feels personally that is right for his or her own body, um, and by trusting one's senses and determine how to use it from there. Um, so my question is, where does the boundary lie between this idea and also the idea that um, coaches and trainers also want what is right for you personally? And how do you balance like what you feel is right and what your coaches and trainers feel is right for you? Mm. Good question, Anna. Obviously, you're following the Institute because you, you were very precise in your explanation of, uh, mm -hmm. of the instinctive perception. This is my most proudest student, if I can interrupt. Very good, very good. <laughs> um, yes, we... It's actually, it doesn't have to be a choice, yeah? So, we all, one of the big studies that we're doing in our, in our institute that we have been doing and we continue to, to develop is uh, the instinctive perception, yeah? Mm -hmm. And where we, we all individually feel and sense our own body, space, time, slightly different, yeah? We're all individuals. Right. So, uh, what happens very often from a coaching uh, aspect, and I did the same mistake when I was a young teacher, yeah? Is that I was teaching everyone what I was doing. Yeah. Right? But they work for certain students, so certain students I consider talented because they could kind of understand what I was saying and they could feel it in their bodies. And then I had other students that no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't get it, right? And I didn't like that as a teacher because I felt very frustrated because I want to help everybody, right? I didn't like that. I, I was not able to help the students. And in certain occasions, in fact, the more the students tried to uh, do what I was asking them to do, the worse they got, right? So I felt a big responsibility there. So that's where, there was a big question that therefore I had already as a young teacher. Then, as I went further in my studies and developments, I became aware of the fact that obviously we are all individual in our personalities and so on, but we are also very individual in how we feel our bodies. So, so the whole idea is, is not to change the technique, right? The technique is the technique, but the technique only belongs to the figures, right? So the figures have a certain technique and that's fine. We should respect that. 
but then how do I relate to that information, right? Or to the information that the teacher is giving me. Uh, the teacher, obviously, if he's a good teacher, will see something wrong. Uh, the teacher will express, let's say, will give a guideline of how to develop through, from their point of view, from their perception, mm -hmm. right? Now, yeah. the whole idea of the Institute is to allow the student to really discover their own individual perception so that there can be a translation yeah, definitely. into that, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, again, personal experiences, I, I had the privilege to study with some great teachers, yeah? Not many because I was very selective, mm -hmm. but some great teachers. But at the end, it was only when I did it the way I perceived it best that also the teachers would say, wow, today you were amazing. Mm -hmm. When yeah. in other occasions where I actually did what, literally what the teacher wanted me to do, they mm -hmm. would say, yeah, today you were good, but not, 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 not great. You know, it was not your best performance, right? So, and this happens often to everybody. So, so at the end, the teacher has an idea of what they want to see and they will describe it from their point of view. Yes. And their point... Yeah, and the point of view comes from their perception. So, but all the, or better, the few great dancers, right? Not the good dancers, but the few great dancers, right? If you look at it, they all look very different, mm -hmm. right? We all have created our own style, right? And the reason why we created our own style is because we tapped into our own instinctive way of movement. That's why we all look very different. Yeah. yeah? When, when dancers are good, actually, good dancers look similar to each other mm -hmm. yeah right? it's only when the dancer steps into becoming a great dancer that then they be becomes unique and that uniqueness comes from generally stumbling into the instinctive way of movement right mm -hmm. now with the institute we have developed actually a, a study and a process where we can speed up the discovery of the instinctive way of movement really how is that uh, it's a long story, obviously, yeah. right? But it's understanding where your centers are, where your direct centers are, how you move your body directly, indirectly, uh, you know, spaces. It's, it's, it's a big study. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing because it can be truly transformative for the student the moment that the student is allowed to move the way he or she are designed to. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, I definitely agree. Thank you so much for answering my question. You are very welcome, Anna. And I'm happy to thank you all for the intriguing question. Yes, thank it's an interesting you. question for sure. Thank you. All right, now our next guest has sent a video. Now this guest is possibly one of your biggest fans. Oh, yeah? From Sicily, representing the country of Bulgaria. I think you know why. Hi Alessandro, hi Luca, hi everybody. Uh, so I'd like to ask to Luca, which is my biggest idol, uh, what uh, does he think about the um, evolution of uh, ballroom dancing and uh, the differences between the ballroom dancing in the WDC and in the WDSF? What does he like? Uh, uh, what do you like more? And what do you think about these new styles which is going uh, around? This is my question. I, I will uh, look forward to hear your reply and the reply to all other uh, questions. Ciao, ciao. Hmm. Okay, this is a, another very good question. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, earlier, right, in one of our, my previous answers, balance is the key, yeah, to life and to, to everything else. And uh, what I do feel WDSF has done, they have gone extremely into the physicality of things, right, and maximizing um, shapes and movements. Um, on the other side, WDC has tried to remain more conventional, more traditional, but generally created a more boring mm -hmm. outcome. Yeah. So I don't like either. 
right? I'm sorry. What do you mean? What do you, what would what so, do you mean by that? And then what and, would you like to see instead? Then right. And uh, and I'm not uh, in this with this statement. I'm not disrespectful to the dancer themselves mm -hmm. because there are talented dancers in everywhere, right? In in all kind of federations and at all kind of levels. Um, but I feel that couples have made the choice, you know, they, they have chosen, okay, I'm going to go totally WDSF. I don't think there should be a WDSF style and I don't think there should be a WDC style. Right. Because right? we, we are connecting to the previous questions from Anna. We are all individuals. Of course. Therefore, I should not be thinking, oh, I need to dance WDSF style or I need to dance WDC style. But in truth, I should dance my style, right? I should mm -hmm. understand what is best for me. What am I great at? Right? As an individual, I'm not great at everything. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to okay. be great at something. We all have gifts. As humans, we all have gifts. So I have to understand what is my gift and then not really be influenced by WDSF or WDC, by these kind of brands, but mm -hmm. really develop what is true to me. And this is what I don't see. And that's why I say I don't like neither. Not because the talent is not there, not because the effort is not there. But because I feel that dancers in WDSF try to fit to WDSF so-called style, and couples in WDC try to fit to the so-called WDC style, mm -hmm. right? And then the I, tendency, I where you're going, yes. right? So the tendency that you have 300 couples all dancing the same on one side and 300 couple dancing the same on the other side. And this is, I feel, this is missing the whole point, mm -hmm. right, of, the, of individuality. So if I look back at history, and uh, I stress again the fact that I'm not about just history, right, but I'm about mm -hmm. evolution, but we have to be very sensitive when we are evolving, because we have to be, sens we, we have to be aware of the essence of what we are evolving. Mm -hmm. Right. Otherwise, it can just become a change for the sake of a change, but not actually bring any improvement. Um, so if I look back at earlier generations, up to my generations and before, there were a lot, there was a lot more individuality. Okay. Right. So you would have five or six couples, right? In the With final, a different style so on the floor, yeah? Totally different style, right? And we were all working to be individual. We were all working to develop our own senses, our own way of doing things, right? Then through the years, I do feel that it has become more of a stereotype, you know? So this, this mm -hmm. couple is winning, okay? So now let's all dance that way. That's true, right? that's then, true. Then it becomes a copying, a copy and a mirror exactly. and a mirror and a mirror. And then you have 300 couples doing the same thing. Exactly, right? And that's missing the point of actually what the competition or what, you know, and no matter if you're going more for the artistic aspect or you're going more for the athletic aspect or you should combine the two. But I want to see individuals on the floor and that's what I don't see. And I see generally the establishment promoting conformism. Hmm, okay, over, and, and, and what is this? Hmm? The, the comfort zone. No, not comfort, like com like conforming. Ah, conforming, excuse me. I right. must have conforming. had a glitch, but yes. it, it's That's intriguing. Right. I... right, so then you have the couple on WDSF, that, and I, you know, I teach all kinds of different couples, right? I teach mm -hmm. students that are competing in WDSF, I teach students that are competing in WDC. The mentality is the same. They try to do what, the stab what they think the establishment wants, mm -hmm. right? Now, that means that the establishment is not promoting a message of, be individual. Right. Right. It means that the establishment is promoting a message of conform and you will be successful. Mm. Okay. But I feel, but I feel this is very limiting at a human level, right? Because the human, human is, has no, no, uh, I mean, no boundaries, right? We can achieve anything. Of course. So of course. We, we should, as humans, we should be allowed, supported, nurtured, promoted to develop our own individuality, mm -hmm. right? Well, let me ask you this, if I could, it's uh, you kind of triggered a question. Uh, with, let's, well, let's just say 300, let's say 300 couples, they are in the WDSF system or WDC, whatever. Maybe do you feel that 
they're scared to be individual or to do something different or to do, oh, that's not normal. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Do you think they're scared like that? I believe that they are concerned. Maybe they're not scared, but there's definitely, there's a, there's a concern. There's a degree mm -hmm. of fear in them, right? Um, of course, yes. But but again, I'm not. Um, I don't believe it ca this fear comes from them. You know, I don't. I don't. It's not about the couples, right? It's about the environment. Ah, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So the couple, obviously, young dancers. You know, I remember when I was a young dancer, right? I wanted to be successful. I wanted to become great, and I wanted to be successful. So, but at that time, I believe I was privileged because I grow. Although in England, right, which is very traditional in, in their approach, mm -hmm. but at that time, the message was become great and you will be successful. And great was defined as listening to your feeling, listening to, your, to how you want to evolve it, respecting the technique. But then what is special about you, right? My teacher used right. to tell me, my teacher used to tell me, you are a genius. Now, what can you do that nobody else can? Right? Now, wow, those words were very powerful, right? Those words were very powerful. And mm -hmm. it was definitely not about conforming, but it was about creating. It was about developing. It was about discovering. Right, right. right. Of course, you have to figure out what it is about you that is individual. Right. And the establishment at the time was promoting that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not that I did it because I'm special and I'm better than anybody else. No, I, I did it because I had a desire for it. But then I had the establishment that created that environment where not only me, you know, from my generation, there are many great dancers that came and we all mm -hmm. came from that generation because of that environment. So at the moment, I feel that the message that the establishments are sending out are much more restrictive and much more controlling. And, uh, and that's why I'm saying I don't like either, right? Because I don't feel they are truly what each dancer wants to do. Oh, okay. Right? But it's no, more I, about I, what they... I see what you're saying. Right? So it's more about what they have to do. So if it's something that you want to do, right, I will respect it. But mm -hmm. if it's something that you do because you have to do it, then you will leave me with a big question mark when you're delivering it. Because it's not really yours. Right. It's it's what was groomed into you. Very, very intriguing. Right. All right. I like that. That was opened up a lot for me in my head. Now, uh, if I can, let's go ahead and bring in our final audience member. She is mm -hmm. checking in with us from the star of Alabama. From Huntsville, Alabama, we have Miss Becky Hamrick. Hello, Becky. Hello. Hello, Sandro. Hi, Becky. Ciao, Luca. Nice to Pleased to meet you. Um, I have to say that Salvo stole my question, sort of. <laughs> he did. Um, <laughs> but I actually wanted to ask about your view on the Latin as well. Is Do you think the same of the Latin, WDSF versus WDC? Yes. At the ballroom. I think, yes, I think so. I think WDC had, had the, in Latin, WDC had... still has possibly a little bit more um, individuality allowed. Yes. Yeah, different from, from the ballroom. The ballroom, I feel the individuality has been kind of been removed. In Latin, I feel there's still some surviving. Um, and yes, I, I feel it over the overall, you know, all, all different styles, you know, and, and again, being exposed to many, to many students, many talented students, many students with a lot of desire to be successful and to become great. But this concern of conforming, right, dominates the desire to express and to be individuals. And I feel that that's a, always a dangerous situation to be in. Yeah? Yes. We, we end up creating a lot of clones rather than individual dancers. Okay. Well, you mentioned earlier that, um, especially young dancers, you know, they're on, they're on the rise. They really want to succeed. They're probably more concerned. There is a great benefit to being a senior dancer. Absolutely. I think. Um, 
Absolutely. What we want to do is to dance the very best that we can as individuals right. mm -hmm. and to please the audience. You know, we're we're wanting to have people enjoy what we do. Right. Um, if that brings good placements or, you know, traditional success, that's great. And if not, that's okay too. Right. So is that maybe more of the approach that you used to have when you wanted to just bring the best that you could bring that you were talking about earlier? Yeah. When you were encouraged then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, to become a great dancer, you have to be very selfish. Right? You have okay. to really get, and I mean good selfish. There's, there's a bad selfish and there's a good selfish, right? The good selfish is I need to take care of me first before I can take care of others. Right? Bad selfish is I don't care about anybody else, I just think about me, right? So I don't mean that selfish, I mean the good selfish. And uh, because at the end, it was about my experience. And I knew that if I was able to experience what I wanted to experience, then everybody watching would experience that with me. Yes. Right? Um, so even before trying to please the audience, like you mentioned, right? I, I, I feel it's even more important is to please yourself. Yes. Right? So if you, if you find fulfillment in what you do yourself, automatically, right, that joy yes. and that, that emotional satisfaction will mm -hmm. overflow and will, of course, touch anybody that is there witnessing what you're doing. Yes, I absolutely okay. understand that joy was the very word I was thinking of, actually. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, so that that would be that is what I promote every. That's why we work on individuality. We work on instinctive perception. We're really working on nurturing the individuality of each dancer, because you know we do believe in the institute that um, every human has gifts, and it is about tapping into them, right? Going in and finding those gifts and really maximizing them. Um, rather than conforming into something that maybe somebody else is great at doing, right? But right. it doesn't have to be copied. Mm. <laughs> Make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Very good. You're very welcome, Becky. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Becky. Thanks, Ali. Well, Mr. Luca Barichi, I would like to thank you so much for joining me these past few hours and uh, joining me on this interview. Uh, I've learned, uh, me and myself personally, you've opened up a lot of uh, different views, which uh, I will definitely be using, and uh, I'm sure all these followers and listeners will as well. I'd like to also give a shout out and thank you to all of our uh, audience members who were here, who shared questions to Salvatore Todro and, and everybody else as well. And Luca, grazie mille. You are very welcome, Alexander. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I hope that listening to the conversation, you know, will inspire dancers to do more and to to maximize their potentiality. Human mm -hmm. potenti potentiality is huge, so I'm looking forward to see that. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Alexander.